is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Jamaica Information Service since 2010. His responsibilities, responsibilities include serving as Chief State Liaison to the Office of the Prime Minister, Office of the Governor General, and the Office of the Leader of the Opposition, and giving oversight to the research, publications, and production of the editorial portal division of JIS. He also hosts the JIS flagship interview program, Issues and Answers, as a means to further the public education thrust of the JIS as it seeks to elucidate the government's response to the national issues of the day. Mr. Boyne joined the JIS, then the Agency for Public Information, API, in 1976 as a feature writer and television broadcaster. In 1983, he became the press secretary and speechwriter to the Minister of Industry and Commerce, Dr. Spires, and from then to 2000, to work with every Minister of Industry on the successive administrations as speechwriter, public relations consultant, after which he then went on to join the JIS again in 2002. So, in other words, a lot of persons are very confused as to whether it's a labor writer or a comic. Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay. Outside of his role with GIS, Mr. Bowen has had a long career in journalism and public relations since 1975. He's perhaps best known as a host of the 26 year old TV program Profile and of late, more, more recent vintage, he's also a host of a very popular program Religious Hard Talk. He's also a columnist for the Southern Leader, largely making his incisive opinions known on matters of religion and governance in the public interest. In 2009, the government of Jamaica recognized his contribution to journalism with the commander of the Order of Distinction, C designation. Mr. Barnes is a minister of religion and the author of Ideas Matter, Journey into the Mind of a Veteran Journalist. But it is in relation to his sudden green involvement that he speaks here today as delivers a lecture based on a column that he wrote in November 2014 entitled Can the Church Be Saved? Please, let's make welcome Mr. Ian Bond. And by the way, he's here with his lovely wife, Margaret, who you know, makes everything much better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman, dear ladies and gentlemen, friends. What an honor it is to be invited here at the premier evangelical uh, seminary in the island to deliver this lecture. I have a long association with the JTS. I would say longer than most of you have, have had. Thirty years ago, I delivered my first lecture here at the JTS. It was 1985. Even before that, I was a regular fixture on this campus from the days when such stellar students as Samuel were here. I remember spending a lot of hours at the home of Dave Sam. Um, also at the home of Roger Ringenberg. Perhaps one or two persons remember who those are. Also have a long association with Dale Palmer. He for one has been relieved at the founding of Amazon. Because before Amazon and my ability to get books by a click, what a wonderful thing. I used to have to read the poems of people like Del Palmer and others. In my insatiable thirst for knowledge and to deal with my addiction to read it. I thank people like Bill for 
facilitate in my addiction and for giving me my fix. So I have a long association with JTS. This is Spencer and others from the library uh, know me. I have also been a pest to them. And I've always considered here a kind of, of home. Certainly I've received a great deal of nurturing from this seminary. And I've had members of my own congregation who on my encouragement have been students at this fine institution. So I'm very happy to be here to engage with you on this subject. Can the church be saved? And what I want to do in this lecture is to look at some of the threats that the church faces and then to propose some means of dealing with these threats. Now the church has faced many threats over its centuries of existence. And it has been the case in the past that the threats, the opposition, the persecution have been to the benefit of the church. The great vehemence of the attacks against the church only served to embolden Christians, only served to deepen the bonds between Christians, only served to lead Christians to deeply reassess their faith and as a result recommit to that faith. So even when we were being thrown to the lands, literally, and when we were used as objects of entertainment, even when Christians had to flee to various places, even when they were denied participation in the Roman guilds. In the face of death, in the face of incalculable persecution, Christians have only grown stronger. Christians have only reaffirmed their faith. And the church become stronger. I want to suggest you now that that history of the overcoming of all the threats should not be taken as a full-fledged guarantee as to what will happen in the future. I suggest that there are certain constellation of forces there are certain things that have come together now that have made the present day threats more ominous, more enduring, and more threatening of the existence of the church as we have known it. So, I anticipate the hubris, or at the very least the optimism, born by a confidence in God and a confidence in the prophecy that the gates of hell cannot prevail. So I know you are people of faith, and I don't want to be saying anything against the Bible, and I'm certainly not an evangelical institution. I don't want to, I don't want to have, a, as a very premise, something that that goes against a prediction that says that you know the, the gates of hell won't prevail. But perhaps the gates of hell might not prevail because there will be people like you who haven't been alerted to 
the threats were moved to do something about it. Because certainly we don't want a fatalistic or a deterministic view of the future. And we know that God's exhaustive foreknowledge would see what is going to happen. And perhaps would see the, the free decisions of human beings in becoming alert to these threats and therefore doing something about, about them. But I do suggest that we have almost a perfect storm of opposition and a perfect storm which suggests a category five hurricane coming right at the, the church. One, we are faced with a militant new atheism. But that is, I mean, the atheistic attacks against the church have not been new. Before the church was in existence, there was a, a, a strong and robust atheistic tradition, even from the pre-Socratic um, philosophers. But certainly the school of ancient skepticism, stoicism, and other uh, prominent schools of philosophy did pose a challenge to Christianity. But even of more recent times, you've had a, a prominent atheist like Nietzsche and others start Camus. The church has had its, its atheistic challenges, the old atheism. But since 2001, after 9-11, because the new atheism really came after that, it was after that Sam Harris wrote his book, End of Faith. He has been one of the, the famed horsemen of the apocalypse. Sam Harris, late Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, and Richard Dawkins. They've had an enormous effect. And the impact that they have had, which has outstripped the impact of the, of the old atheists, certainly far more people know about Dawkins and they know about Nietzsche, uh, or even about Mackey and the older um, atheists. Precisely because of a phenomenon I talked about in that article, the technological revolution, which has given us the internet, the information revolution, because now the atheists have the means of propagating their ideas to vast numbers of people. They have the means of making the ideas accessible, digestible, and seemingly irresistible. Old medium, of course, had enormous powers in themselves, you know, TV, satellite TV, cable TV, enormous influence, enormous power to spread ideas. But on you know this little phone are smaller ones than than this. People can have access to the most debilitating ideas to Christianity. Easy access 24 hours a day. And this 
new information age which has made available skeptical ideas on religion and now you can you can go back and read all the old atheists you can read all the old skeptics they they have the writings of all of the doubters and all of the skeptics 18th century, 19th century, earlier, people now have access to all of that. A book I quoted in one of my recent articles, Living the Secular Life, um, just published last year by atheist Stigma, social professor. And he has done a lot of empirical work. Um, he has actually gone out to talk to people who are no longer religious. Uh, very, very important. Uh, primary research book because he talks to various people who are living without religion um, and he talks to people from various circumstances who are living happily, he reports, who are living contentedly without religion and without any belief in an, in an afterlife. And he has a chapter on irreligion rising. And he talks about the various reasons why irreligion has been rising. In fact, a previous book of his is entitled Faith No More, Why People Reject Religion. He says in this his latest book, Living the Secular Life, New Answers to Old Questions. The internet allows people who may be privately harboring doubts about their religion to immediately connect with others who also share doubts. So there were many people who had questions about these Bible stories of you know, God sending you people into the land of Canaan to exterminate Canaanites. What questions about God telling Saul to, to kill everyone, you know, in spirit the animals or the children. Questions about these things. And questions about what now seem like ethnic cleansing and genocide in the Old Testament. That in Sunday school they were, you know, taught that. God was loving and that God was just. And that when these things are just some mysterious things that, you know, almost leave because as Deuteronomy says, the secret things belong to the Lord, but those which are revealed belong to me and your children must leave that alone. So, a number of people always had questions that their pastors could not answer, their church leaders and Sunday school teachers could not answer. And, and they were discouraged to pursue those lines of questions because they feared that the prophecy that a strong delusion would come on them would in fact come to pass. But in the privacy of their rooms, their homes, they could go on various forums type in certain questions and be connected with other people who had these same questions but more who had answers answers they were not getting from the churches and answers which seemed plausible answers which connected with them connected with their hearts connected with their moral sentiments connected with a with an inner outrage they always felt about this God and his modus operandi. They didn't have to go to libraries and pour over big books to find these answers. These answers are now in their own language, in tweetable form. 
So they could relate and could find accessible answers to their questions. And they would find a community of, of seekers, of questioners. It was said of oh, it was exposure to media, satellite television, that brought down communism. It was hard. Because before the communists controlled information, people in Eastern Europe thought that that was it, you know. Long lines and music as part of life. You began to see images that of supermarket shelves filled and people living well in Los Angeles and California and so on. And they began to say it was another way of life. And one of the main things the US did, the US created Radio Free Europe. And then there was radio when people now began to see, when the Eastern Europeans began to see what was possible. And when the communists no longer could control information, they no longer could control the people. Communism fell, not just because of economic problems, because you know, a lot of regimes have had economic problems and so on. What was important was that leaders had lost control of the information, had lost control of the propaganda. The communists always understood the importance of propaganda, package information, manage information. Once they lost control of that, that is why in China today, with all of the reforms, with all of the modernization, China still controls the media and controls the internet. You do not have unrestricted access to the internet. And no matter what President Obama and others say, the pressure of the Chinese communists maintain their control over the internet. The Cuban communists maintain their control, not to mention the, 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 the North Korean extremists. So the church also, the church had its own narrative, the church had its own story. That it gave the people on Sunday and Saturdays. People bought it. And because a lot of people have a version to read it anyway, only a few would be going to read books that would question. And sometimes we even get those books. But now, by clicking in some questions on the internet, you are linked to people who have the same questions. So you have, a, you have a worldwide community now of seekers and doubters and skeptics. So after this, that this is how the media helped in the destabilization of Eastern Europe, the fall of communism, and the fall of the Berlin Wall. So the internet is contributing to the fall of the church and the dominance of religious ideology. So I go back to, to Zuckerman. Zuckerman says, in other words, the internet fosters and spurs secular community. Nazi and atheists, skeptics, humanists, agnostics, even those in the most remote are fundamentalist of communities, can reach out to others online instantly, finding comfort and information which encourages or strengthens their secularity. So this easy access, ubiquity of the, of the internet, the easily accessible information, all of these, we, you go online or all the American um, these, you can read their writings, you can read the writings of all the, of all the skeptics. And if you don't want to read the writings, you just link with others who have very serious doubts about various issues. And the church, and some of you will say happily too, a lot of members of the cults have left the cults. People have left Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, Christadelphians, 
the Armstrong movement because people have left as a result of more people. <laughs> I understand your category. Yes, I understand your categorization. But so uh, members of the conflict movement, people of you know, dug up information on Armstrong. The information was tightly controlled. There was a, a certain line of, of propaganda that was put out. Now people can go back and read all that happened at the headquarters of the Armstrong movement. Um, these doctrines, which were claimed to be uh, unique. Well, put other things to say, well, you know, Armstrong might have copied these things and so on. So that so the cults have lost, they have lost a lot of members um, uh, too. The church has lost a lot of members. Because I said the power, it's the power of the internet, the power of information, and they and the whole the decentralization of information. And the fact that of this easy accessibility you have that and also at the same time what you have with the post cold war world I know it's not there, there are a number of factors you know the, the factors are geopolitical economic it's not just one factor you can just look at the religious factors and look at the technological factors, the geopolitical factors, the economic factors, the sociological factors. All of these factors are working against historic Christianity. Since 1989, with the triumph of the United States, and the vanquishing of the Soviet Union, the eventual split up of the Soviet Union. What you now have is a one world ideology. Francis Fukuyama, in his, in his optimistic, wrote a book called The End of History. He was so, he, he was so ebullient about the prospects of the post Cold War era. And you know, he went back to Hobbes and, and, and so on and says we have reached now, we have reached the end of history. So history was you know, all of these the struggle, and the struggle was scarcity and so on. We have reached the end of history now with the triumph of capitalism. Of course it has been proved to himself has had to recant um, now because the that optimism has not been Sustain and certainly with the the global crisis of 2008, so that optimism has been has been muted. But with a sense that there is no viable alternative to capitalism, there is no viable alternative to the market system. It's not like the 70s where we have a war. That there was another way. It was not like the 60s when someone went to play well, there was even a third way. Well, we do have to follow the, the Soviet Union, we do have to follow the US, but we would have another line thing. No! There's one way, the market alone. And there were those who were not communists, but they were in economics, they were Keynesians who believed that. Well, you know, the state should have a, an, an important part in society, but in the 80s, with the election of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, it was a major change in the world. And change not just international relations, but it changed society. My Thatcher made a famous statement there that there was no such thing as society. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Jamaica, you know, we had a politician talking about money jingling in their pocket. We had also become weary of the struggles. We had also become weary of, of, of communitarianism and, you know, arguments about cooperatives and all that thing. The other thing is to feel 
And we couldn't get anything to, to buy and people were, were, were marrying, and, you know, tampon with toothpaste in uh, Jamaica. You know, somebody too young to remember those days. Soap was rationed. So all of us in the 80s and 70s said, but well, socialism thing can't work. It's an idealistic thing, you know. But it can't work. It's not practical. Human beings are not like that. Human beings are, you know, self-seeking and so on. So what you have now is a very hedonistic culture. What you have now is a culture of measing. 60s you had black power, you had pan-Africanism in you know, the 70s and so on. You had strong Rastafari beating down Babylon and Babylon's values and all that kind of thing. All those things are mooted now. Rastaman want a big car, Rastaman want a big now and all that kind of thing. Rastaman move up in a society now, a step up in a life. You know, socialists have one in suit now and all that <laughs> So there's no challenge of this market society. What you have is now is a market economy, a market society. And everything is now reduced to marketize, everything is now reduced you know, to have a monetary value. Everything is reduced, it's not just theology has been affected. So people now are seen as really means to an, to an end. Relationships are transactional. People are looking to see what they can get out of your place. You know, I love relationships, you call or is your work or work a boss or whatever. Or a student lecturer or anything. You know, I see what they can get. People looking out for themselves. So you have this So try to know in the US, you have, a, you have a unipolar world. US alone in control. No challenge to US dominance. No alternate world view being presented. Except this now, this now is the only, is the only challenge down to the West. But then because the extremist elements of Islam are the ones that are getting the most publicity. It's easy for the Western media now to discredit that, to discredit that kind of challenge. But what you see is intolerance and bigotry and, and mayhem and so on. Nobody wants that. So Islam is not culturally appealing. If you're going to challenge a worldview, it has to be culturally appealing. If you are going to be engaging in countercultural war, you have to be skilled, you have to know. How to intersect with the dominant culture and how to be able to, 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 to pull away at the dominant culture. Use its own premises and its own bases to destabilize it. The church has to be involved, it is inevitably involved in a culture war. But I suggest that the church is losing that. And there are a number of things working against the church. So I say, you have the hedonistic values. You have the technology fostering this atomism. So each person now, each person is creator. You know, Marshall McLuhan, a famous communications expert, he said famously the, the medium is the message. So technology he said was not as neutral. I mean Marx himself, you know, I still believe in the genius of, of Marx. In his, in, 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 in his analysis of his prescriptions. But Marx talked about that whole how the means of production affect the society, how the base affected the superstructure. And famously said that the, the handmill gave you the feudal lord and the industrial the machine, the industrial, uh, the steam engine, the industrial capitalist. 
and your communications technology now with all its emphasis on the individual with things you can adapt the technology to yourself i mean you're not in the age anymore of mass communications you're not in the age of broadcasting people create their own thing watch them thing on the morning time i mean netflix and all of these is part of a phenomenon people are they, they create they what they what they want anymore and so they are not those hapless consumers now right so there's that power that they that they have so all of this when the church is very central and integral to the church as well you have community central and integral to the new technology is individuality so there's been an increase in a whole deinstitutionalized thinking that's why if the only church many church people don't turn off from the church it's quick november and start in one church that they want to live in one church and church and meet and this good place at this church room and thing first time people take all kind of things in the church and pass that they want to never patient you know when you go to one supply to you know you'll be patient you know all some wine and do anything everything for the sake of elect people now and do everything for the sake of which elect the people they are, they are electing themselves now people not putting up with whatever things now pastors and leaders anymore it's a cultural thing where people are feeling that boy, they must be satisfied. They are part of a therapeutic culture that says that their needs must be satisfied. It's a seeker-oriented culture. It's debilitating to church, to institution, to, to community. So you have where the the, 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 the technology the technology is creating a certain kind of human being the technology is not neutral and contrary to the view because the view that well there's a great thing about technology you know is that why everybody it it really allows for the dispersal i know everybody you know can have a blog and it's it's, it's democratization but some very good books that have come out recently are shown as it's not true, it's a myth. Still a few people control the message. Still control the internet. Who oh, is powerful? <laughs> no, by this myth that way, you know, you create you have your one thing and powerful. No. There's greater concentration now. Greater concentration of media. Not just in all media. But now you have more and more, a lot of the independent newspapers and TV stations have been bought up by the big guys. So that is happening in with, with the old media, who have, who have tremendous influence on new media. And new media themselves, controlled by a few. So what you have is a few controllers, yet you don't have this wide as much of diversity of messages as you would have thought. And the same set of values. A set of values antithetical to Christianity. Jesus, the founder of Christianity, says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. And that is the ideology of the age. That's the ideology that you are really what you possess. You're not going to produce a man of pieces of hard work. We want to see a guy that be my one, no way to live and what appliances you have. I check what you work hard. That's what you have. That's what you have with cash flow. How much bring you have? So people now get their authenticity from consumption. from possessions. What I'm saying is not irrelevant to the, to the threat of the jury. I want to show you how deep-seated is the threat. How deep-seated 
is the threat and how multifaceted and multidimensional is a threat. You have basically now one view in the world marketization. You have some powerful institutions like International Monetary Fund. International Monetary Fund determines what the country's priorities are. So you have national governments, and some of you get excited about politics and put in with a PMP or GMP. <laughs> PNP or GNP, either or both of them are going to find the other part. Who will reject the MF? So you have the progressive PNP, and you used to be progressive at least. <laughs> I was following it, I'm a part and blissfully announced in the past of this. And when they send shout, you know, always criticize. They are going to have to follow the same thing. So where we are put in Jamaica House? It is what Washington says. And of course it is a theological document. What? Of course it has to be priorities. Of course it tells you what you may spend on health and, and of course education and how much you will give back in debt. That is making a theological statement. And look at the estimates like last week, for example, a big part of it. Capital expenditure, when you check it down, the biggest part of that so called capital expenditure is going to go to the capitalists. The financial crisis of 2008 was brought about by some greedy people, casino capitalists, brought about by a set of immoral actions. This is not just what religious man talking, this is what the economists are saying, this is what the conservative people are saying. But the world has to pay for that. The U.S. brought the world in this crisis. And there was a system of socialism for the bankers. And the bankers got to the people who brought in the crisis. They got bailed out. And the poor in America suffered. And the poor in America in the world. Because, the, because of globalization now and the interconnectedness of the world economy. What happened in the U.S.? For us in the subprime crisis, which went full blown in 2008, that triggered a global financial crisis. Countries like Jamaica, our balance sheet was affected. And there is no global mechanism that there is no global mechanism of justice that will ensure that countries like Jamaica, affected by conditions outside of themselves and outside of their own sovereign action, there is no mechanism that says that funds must be created to help them. And worse than in the income country, we are not even like the hippie, the highly indebted um, uh, poor countries, where certain concessions are provided for them. And Sub Saharan Africa has done very well. But one of the reasons why Sub Saharan Africa has done very well is a significant part of the debt was written off because of the facility where they could have been written off because they were, a lot of them were among the least developed countries. So you have a, you have a world of injustice. And globalization also, notice the thing, globalization which forces marketization. So we are making decisions based purely on efficiency. Now efficiency is important. And I think that they, they left here in the, in the 70s went to extreme. The fact is you cannot have economic development without economic growth. So there needs to be economic growth. You need to have your fiscal prudence. So what Phillips is doing is extremely important. We need to manage our appetites and manage our spending. That's a fact. So I'm not now <laughs> saying that you know we just privilege human needs and forget about efficiency. Efficiency is important. But you cannot reduce everything 
So just efficiency. Other values have to come in. And this is where I see, for example, the church has an important role to critique, for example, I don't hear the church's voice much on the direction of the country. I'm not talking about you know, just a voice on some discrete issues. I'm talking about a philosophical critique. Philosophical critique that would bring on the judgment of the two parties. But the two parties are essentially agreed in oh my dear little dear contest for power. If you look at the basic strategies in terms of econ e economics, the two parties are essentially agreed on a neoliberal part. The two parties are committed to the IMF. There might be some variation in the theme. The church needs to critique this neoliberal part itself that the two parties have agreed to. The unions are marginalized. There is no progressive voice in the country blowing the whistle on the neoliberals who are going who have whose ideology is dominant in the administration. And the JP has looking to come in and follow the same path. And what implications all that has for the church? Well, church members live in the society. So they face the same pressures. Everything now reduced to money. Dog in dog society. Every man I look out for himself. Rugged individualism. All of these things are a threat to the church. Notions about helping one another and being your brother's keeper and all. People laugh at these things here now. I mean, they might, in after they are speeches, give credence to them. But it is not really valorized in the society. Young man who now says that he wants to be a teacher, community worker, and so on. Rather than go get a degree and go in business and technology. That we're supporting. And I would predict that on this very campus, how many persons register at JTS to do theology or philosophy? I can bet that most of your courses is, is counseling and some other pragmatic thing. I'm not taking a survey, I can bet. <laughs> A lot of the world, you know, the theology course on a hat. When man lecturing on bath and all that kind of thing, I don't think other people packing up those things. People are not interested in ideas. Because most of man, they say years ago, philosophy can't party up. He would love an era like this, but this is his era. He did it before it. The full blown. Full blown valorizing of his ideas. So, so all of this is happening. You have the globalization, unipolar world, US with its values, the influence of North American culture and Jamaica, and Jamaican youth. Talk to the Jamaican youth and find what really influenced them. You talk to them about the hip hop stars and ask them who is the minister of agriculture. I bet you they won't do it. You can tell you what Kim Kardashian is doing. <laughs> the serious problem. You have lost the youth. You, you try and gauge them and, and, and things serious. I mean, they, Technology and the phone and the, it's a serious thing. So, the, so the, the technology, the values, is one set of ideas being propagated. People are getting ahead. This life is it. Is it. It's a matter of possessions. All of these things are debilitating through church. And then now, the church capitulates. Proclaiming the prosperity gospel. The segment of the church that is really growing is a segment which is just capitalism and religious garb. It's the same values being pervaded in 
a religious form, so that those who are into religion, well, we have something here for you now. We package this thing for you. Prosperity, health and wealth, gospel. Fix it very well with neoliberal ideology that puts the focus on the believer, on the community. What Jesus is doing for him, where he can't get from Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the boss. <laughs> and what the market has failed to give you. If you have not succeeded in the market like the world, man, who make it big through the market transaction, Jesus can do it. You can name it and claim it. You can see how better thing and name this. And claim it. And you don't have to go through the whole bad work and all that thing because. I can tell you that the wealth and the, the, the wicked laid up for the righteous man. Forget them thing that. So you're moving back and I can see no capitalism. The whole time capitalism was influenced by Calvinism with the hard work and all. Move away from that. Western capitalism. Years ago, the great um, Harvard socialist done a very important work looking at the, the cultural contradictions capitalism, cultural capital contradictions. So capitalism starts up as you must work hard, you must be thrifty, you must save and so on, but after we start emphasizing overconsumption, you are in a stage of capitalism now where the big thing is to spend and to consume and all that kind of thing. It's not so much a hard work thing. Because most of the money, the financialization of the economy is now. Financialization the finance economy is much bigger than the productive economy. The productive economy has been declining. I just read an article about the deindustrialization of the world. The entire world being deindustrialized with services and mostly financial services. People are make money from not you don't make money from working. You know, full people are working hard and make money nowadays. And when you don't know what market you are working hard. You have to more poor you invest, you have to make money. The steep and go to beach and Carry the world is a money and money and money and work for you and you're worth money and more. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to get when you're doing it. So the values of the capitalism, the old time capitalism change. And this prosperity gospel should be some false theology because again now, <laughs> for people who don't believe, you know, in, in my religious tradition, you know, the Old Testament is significant and so on. But well, it's ironic that people with little attachment to the Old Testament, and certainly we all know that the Old Covenant is abolished. That is clear. How can the prosperity theology you know, is based on the Old Covenant promises of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28? Old Testament promises made to a nation that people just pull out of context and apply to themselves. I mean, even, you know, I've interviewed people where, you know, even the command to some Israelites, I would want every part of the land, you step on in a cane and it's yours. And people know what kind of, you know, and supply that from time to day, you know, and then step on is, 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 is theirs. A number of passages from the Old Testament that were clearly set in a eudemonistic context, a context of God working with Israel and blessing and that kind of contract. People are quoting now. You know, I've been young and you know, I've never seen the right of a seed and I've seen making bread. There's a certain context for that kind of theology. Now, I'm not saying everything is, is bad about the prosperity theology. And certainly, I'm not saying that the earlier, there were earlier forms of a God loves the poor, God loves our poverty and all that kind of thing. That's another extreme. That God delights in our poverty and, you know, the, the, the humbler you are, the poorer you are, God doesn't want you to be successful. So that was an extreme that we really should have come from. But the corrective is not prosperity theology. Because what what prosperity theology does is that it, it succumbs and capitulates to the dominant ideology. And it 
it makes the individual because the individual once he can get what he wants once he is healthy and money working all right I mean, I, 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 I interview some people and we tell them to take one credit card, you know, and blue on it, you know, and blue on it, you know, and you go in and, uh, you know, they have less debt. <laughs> <laughs> I have been told that I, I, I have a well-known uh, DJ here. He might have eaten up in, in Africa a few weeks ago. And he was blowing in people's handbag. And he said, money come in the handbag. Yes. Of course, I passed my thing to the way in the door. But you reminded me of when I got the blessing. I was remember I was saying something to him in the church and so on. But so you have a lot of this going on. And the segment of the church that is growing most is the health and wealth prosperity. You want to pop up a place. You want if, if I was giving if I was doing some healing today, <laughs> it's a good thing. He advertised me as a part of the deal. I prefer to get visa. When people want to pray, you get your visa. Carry me go over at the indoor sports thing here, man. And nobody will be late. People come around to want to come close to me. The touch will get all those things. That's what carry this thing now. Go tell, uh, tell man about more tribulation and the kingdom and this and through patience and so on, they will inherit. What do you find? Nobody wants to talk about discipleship. Nobody even thinks think that about what you must do and the, the, the Christian lifestyle and, and so on. Nobody think that anymore. People want a God who can get something from. Can get a house. They are a husband. Because I didn't be a good man hard to find himself. <laughs> My wife was lucky, you know. <laughs> <laughs> she, she comes to God regularly, you know, family worship. You will find that now, but find a good thing. <laughs> so, yes, but seriously. So the prosperity gospel does not challenge. The culture, it is subsumed in the culture. And so, you don't have a church see it because when you look in, in, in Latin America, in Africa, the church grows. There's a church growing. So, in some parts of the world, we know that in the West, I mean, the guy Zuckerman has some really depressing. Figures as to how religion has declined in, in industrialized West. And of course, Peter Berger had that um, theory, secularization theory, a long time that as, as countries become more secular, they become less religious and so on. And so, I mean, the US is still a holdout. But, oh, we said the US is a holdout, the US is, is, is different. But if you look at the kind of religion that's declined, the mainline religions have declined. The churches that are the mega churches, what the possible the gospel? So you see, Christianity is growing in Latin America, growing in Africa. So, but what kind of Christianity? At what cost is this growth? And is it the biblical? You know, we have the first disagreements about Christianity. <clears throat> you, 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 what's a common core that we could recognize about Christianity? What's a common core about sacrifice, about involvement with others, about giving our lives for others about privileging community about good neighborliness and so on those things are not being taught you want us to join us in it is one message join us in us one message guys my house it does want to think about talk about that but it serves well it, it it plays to the market people are buying those books I'm right up to the we are the cross. I had a penalty as well. I said, we're going to buy the we are the cross. I think the man, you know, would have to make him come and take up his cross and fight. Don't write those kind of books, you will not buy them. But write about prosperity and how to, how to make money. 
I suggest, therefore, that when you look at the the combination of things, new atheism, the accessibility, skeptical views, also a lot of a lot of issues with the Bible, Bible interpretation for a long. We have neglected to deal with hermeneutics and that kind of thing. And we have spent a whole bit of time, you know, with a lot of emphasis on counseling and helping you with family life and making your services more, you know, seeker friendly and, you know, hospitable and people must have a, they must have a good worship experience when they come and all of those things are great enough. It's true, we, you know, we really shouldn't sanitize boredom. You know, it's all our traditional church is too boring and dull, and our preachers are too highfalutin about people's heads. But if all you do is give people a good worship experience, after that time, when they start up questions, you know, if you don't develop them, because what Bible study? What we come to the Bible study? Let people empty the church. Empty the, if you have Bible study, one or two, ten, fifteen, whatever come. But Sunday now they come for dance and have a good time and the Lord and over bad music and all entertainment. Let me tell you something now. Kind of doubts and the questions and things of people about Bible. A man, a whole bunch entertainment outside. They never come to church for that. A whole bunch entertainment here for. They need to find a reason why they should be in church. Yes, it should be spiritually rewarding. But they need to have a reason, they need to have an intellectual, a theological reason why they should be committed to the church and not to some New Age religion or not to Buddhism or to Christian science or a new thought. Why the Christian church? Why the Christian gospel? So I suggest that you have to start to pay attention to us first to, to rescue the church, and to start paying more attention to the philosophical. I'm telling you. And again, I know that there's not much of this emphasis. Your people, members of the congregation, they are online. They are reading a lot of skeptical things about Genesis. A lot of skeptical things about Leviticus. The issue of homosexuality is a major, major issue that has to be dealt with. Has to be engaged. Why a lot of the secularists are enraged with the church. The church in the last past and a whole lot now. This full equality. You will have a variety of views here. Whatever your views, we need to engage this topic. Why it's a big thing? Zuckerman points out, he said one of the major reasons to be turned out from church is homosexuality. I'm telling you, a lot of you, especially the younger generation, turn out from the church because they feel like the position is, is, is backward you now. I'm going to tell you. But, if you're, you're going to have to deal with the with that issue as well as other contentious issues, why? Because one of the reasons, put out whatever homosexuality is, you don't care. That's, that's not the issue. One of the reasons why it's such an intractable issue is you're in an age of the sovereignty of desire. You're in an age where people believe that once you feel something, you really should have have the right to obey your terms. You have to understand that. You have to understand that philosophically this thing. Here. <clears throat> so the homosexual, you know, put a great right on it. In regard as, as unnecessary, it's, it's not pressure. The top of people must control this thing or live celibate. It's, it's too hard. You recently rock bell last week saying the church will be relevant and it has to come deal. You can't, rock bell will say you can't depend on 2,000 years text. When you have before you, flesh and blood people are lonely. Okay, you have to be lonely and all that. 
He might be right, but what, what I'm trying is the philosophical notion. Look, how you feel so you shall express it. Which may lead you know, to pedophilia. And I'm not saying the gay people don't understand. They might say, but they're comparing homosexual pedophilia. No, no, no. It's the point is. There are some people who are proclivity to our pedophilia. So once you start with the field of because I feel something, or even if there's a strong genetic disposition toward it, what I think you're a child, even if there's a strong genetic disposition, the very point about civilization, even Dawkins admits, Dawkins say you can't follow Darwinianism as a societal model. Who says biology must determine philosophy? So society has always been about the reigning of certain kinds of desires. But now you have a philosophy of the sovereignty of desire, which is related to the marketization of the, of the world. The marketization is not a matter of just the economy, you know. It's of the society. Where people are seeing things now in terms of utility, not in terms of ethics. So you as Christians, you know, I include you as Christians, have to start to be a serious philosophical critique. You see the church. Because one, you go after answering the new atheists, <clears throat> you go after answering the days, the agnostics, the people who simply say, because you're the postmodern Assyria. There are many who say, listen, I don't care, it doesn't matter what you believe. It's not possible for us to know what is right or wrong. Uh, discussions about right or wrong are discussions about power, or about semantics, or about language games. The church must produce thinkers, rigorous thinkers, who can challenge these ideas from Christian perspective. So I would be able to say we can't marginalize thinking. It's not just a battle of a real Peter walk down and find out about church growth and find out what good strategies and a teaching thing there. The most fanciful good strategies they have will create a loving church, a natural church event. All of them curious. Eh? People not going to stay in the church, no matter how they love it and so on. Because they can get love in other places. Or even if they stay, they are not going to be staying for authentic reasons. So you might get them. But the church will still be lost right there with it when it peace back up. I suggest also we engage the culture. I think the gospel DJs have been doing a good job in terms of using the popular um, idiom, using dance hall to reach people. It's a very important phenomenon. So they, they, and, and they take popular themes, they push chastity, they will knock certain things through the dance hall idiom. Very, very important. I know there's a kind of not much uh, the, the, the concerts going on here now and so on, but Christian businessmen and philanthropists need to support it. They like, need to reach the youth. And it's a means of getting, of preaching certain values through the gospel dance art medium. I strongly recommend that. I strongly recommend our Christ, Christian theater. You have to know, start to engage the culture. So you have to do it through, through dance art, use the gospel dance art, through drama and traditional media too few church people are very present in, in the media you leave up the media to all these secularists many of them very little content intellectually shallow intellectually flaccid weak and you have abandoned the public sphere and leaving out all these secularists who control uh, opinions and, and, and whose their faces you see on TV and all that sort of thing. We need to encourage the youth to go in media to challenge the values. And I want to suggest also in our preaching, as I was for questions, I want to suggest that our preaching has become far more, more, more practical and more pointed. You preach it. If you see where going in culture, preach against it. You can't deal with corruption. You deal with, if you, all right. You deal with corruption. If you're a society that really a teach that people must get ahead and have a right to get ahead and so on, and people get an opportunity to get them blind. Why should they do it? You see what? Our society doesn't give people certain respect unless they have certain things. 
And if you see they can't get it through the formal economy, and they are corrupt means. And plus, they are in a, a state of moral confusion where they say, boy, who knows what is right anyway, and, you know. So already they have that moral confusion. So why wouldn't they do it? The preaching therefore has to be practical and pointed at their Jamaica is a, is a great place to preach because there are so many things we have to preach about. There are so many things we have to preach against. There are so many things that we have to call attention to. I suggest that and I find that I think that the Christian businessmen, the philanthropists, the philanthropists need to support that I'm pushing the, the gospel um, down south. Good to have fun in the sun to make a prize, spend a whole money. Apart from funniness, on if you spend some money as a Clinton Trism doing something on atheism, and fees you know, and felt up and copper blessing, you know, as Tony Williams has given him some work. More of the businessmen have to help put on some forum, just like all the political people, human rights people, and others, sponsor people on TV and radio. We just sponsor some forum where we have our best thinkers come on the forum, propagate Christian ideas, question the values of the society. Except we do these things, except first of all, we understand the multiplicity of the challenges that we have and the multi pronged nature of the challenges and except we understand the overarching the overarching problem you know this philosophy well people don't know the overarching problem is there there is an ideology and Marx the genius Marx said the ideas of the ruling class are the ruling ideas Marx talked about false consciousness and the great thing he said about the ideology the great thing about ideology, and ideology is most pervasive when it passes off itself as common sense. And what you have in this society you now is where secular thinking is seen as just common sense. And Christian thinking is seen as backward foolish. For the church to be seen, it has to reverse that. It has to make Christianity seem like the common sense and secularism seem for the nonsense it really is. I thank you. Thank you, Brother Ian. Yeah. We have a few moments for some questions and answers at this time. So let's get right to it. Any questions or answers about like this? But but there was a time when the church was more predominantly what we would see in the New Testament. In other words, even though there was always this strong influence from um, the society and always this you know, struggle has always been said between the two cities. I think that in the past there were more express expressions and more opportunities for the light of the gospel 
to shine through. I say that now there is so much of a squelching of that. That there has never been a time when, and I'm saying, um, Mr. President, that the, the technologies, the, uh, the fact of globalization, that certain phenomena has made the marginalization of the church more pronounced. And these phenomena did not exist before. The globalization, um, particularly the, 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 the technologies, the diffusion of the technology and so on. These instruments of ideological control and of cultural imperialism are what have given the, what I call the anti-gospel forces, the potency. And that is what, you know, makes the influence so lethal. So it's a kind of age, in other words, people, our kids have taken up with them, with them phones, taken up with Facebook and thing. And in fact, you know, there's, there's a little quote, I'll, I'll just give you a um, very, very brief. Uh, Zuckerman is, is a very fine um, atheist. Someone says you can't say that all the because I was a fool. I don't want to get exegesis. But you know, it points out another thing about the, the internet, you know, that it's not just that so much of information is available. He said the internet may be supplying something psychological, or feeding something neurological, or establishing something cultural via its individual computer screen nexus. Something dynamic that is edging out religion, replacing religion, weakening religion. This is great. The entertainment available on the internet, the barrage of imagery, the simultaneity, the mental stimulation, the looking and the clicking, the hunting and the find, finding, the time wasting, the consumerism, the constant social networking, the virtual communication, all of it may be undermining religion's ability to hold our interests. Draw our attention. Tap our soul. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I know it's an accident, but I still think that church potentially is a church when it's marginalized. Uh, it is as a minority that is starting to discover. I started by saying that. So, so, so. But I think that. I, I, I actually feel that this dying, growing church. No, but Tim, all right. At last, at last, people can listen again. Can, they can enjoy the world in a chapel because the ideas are so complex, they are not entertaining. But so riveting because they are. I started by anticipating you. <laughs> you weren't here, but I started by saying that some would think that this has happened before. But I come with the phrase, this time it is different. I think this time it is different. I think that the marginalization could become permanent. That when I say that there are few people who can deal with the boredom, that I don't think, I, I don't share your optimism, um, President, mm -hmm. that, you know, people are going to be going for these ideas. I don't see, I, I don't see the source of hope. And I, I don't want to lose. I'm supposed to get no, 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 right. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think you're wrong. What's the I just see the analysis. There are more people studying that, you know, than there were about you. There are fewer in relation to the percentage of people studying. Yes. But there are more. What is the sad thing is that the church has no place for it. The church doesn't have any room for the trained minister yes, who has been prepared for the exact man yes. for the one who has to express this. Yes, sir. Sir. Well, all right. Uh, so, 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 so I accept your analysis. So you were, yes. I accept your analysis. But the question is, are we going to abandon that and go with them? Or are we going to keep doing digging like this Yeah. Uh, what's the source? I mean, like on your campus, I have it earlier. Would you find that most of the people who are, interested, who are expressing interest in programs are 
programs that can help them to be career counseling and you know, utility. Or when they come in like the old ideas, you know, come several class feel about it. But I'm not saying that counseling is not a big part of it and helping people. That's a big part of it, right? But I'm saying that also feeds into this therapeutic culture. And I am saying in addition to helping people mend their marriages, mend their lives, deal with them child abuse, those are important things. But one doesn't have to be a Christian to do that. There are, you know, what is exclusively Christian that, that, that we have, that we're, we're given? It is precisely in the theological areas. And if people are not going for that, so what you could have, you know, you could have the church or the institution surviving, but not really Christianity. <laughs> church is surviving, but, but it's merely captured. It's captured by the general culture. You know, people come and get a good therapy, get a motivational message, and they go home and they're better. You know, they're really into the lives better. That's good, and that's an important part of um, Christianity. But um, is the job done? And if they don't get a kind of a solid immersion in Christian theology, um, which can't be separated from self-sacrifice and from suffering, you know, all of these kinds of uh, things. If they don't get that, when the pressures reach them, what will keep them? If you will be with corruption, when the pressures reach them, and I mind most of the people are offering them all of this, and he, he can move out of Jonestown and come live on Meadow Road. What do we keep him for, for, for still at Jonestown and suffer with the whole society and all the church? Tell him, say, why, if you have enough faith, you will have to better than that. We are trying trying to, to get a source of solace and him doing the right thing, you know. I, I, I see the tension. But I believe that the first thing that the church needs to be saved from is not the outside influence, but the internal one, which is what I think the president is saying about theology. The fact is that what it is not so much what we need to be saved, well, we need to be saved from who and what. Who are those people who are not trained, who knows no theology, who knows the Bible, but on the platform preaching this rubbish? And then the what that we need to be saved from is is the ensuing theology that comes from it. So therefore, the real solution to the problem is even though they engage them in these other years, because I agree, it, it, it really is not different. It might come in a different way, but the church started out in an age of information. Yeah. You know, Rome was providing means to travel. The, 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 the Greeks were very, very bright and they had influenced the world with knowledge. Because the church knew it really is a means of engaging them at their level, both with theology. That's right. Now, until we recognize the value of theology, and I agree with Rev too, That's in right. that you, you have the church don't have the right amount of theology. True. That's the problem. Yes. So until yes. we can change the pastors that are there yes. to see the value of theology, That's right. to get them to understand what the word is saying. Absolutely. And boy, this is really the open battle. We must find change from within Absolutely. to save the church. It's not so much outside. Uh, before you start, I will share with a friend something that Adrian said when he visited the church. Yes. That in the history of the church, five times the church went to the dogs. And on each occasion, it was a dog that died. <laughs> yeah, they know you're optimistic. Yeah, they know you're optimistic. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned the dogs are the idiom as one. Yes, we the problem. What are your views on the translation? I'm going to translate the back to Patro. Can that be a way of saving the church? Yeah, well, well, why? You know the difficulty of. Um, difficulty of reading, even though people like Devon says that that's only um, an initial um, difficulty. I don't think that, I think that a lot of the preachers already preach it back up, already interpret the text, you know, in back ways. 
So I don't know that that is the is is, is a major. I, I would why because people are not more what people are read, but people are more oral um, people. So I put more on the on the word and the dance rather than reading up without. Mm-hmm. And I'm just 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 wondering, sorry about that. You spoke about reading yeah, but it was a different it was a different culture one. It was a religious culture. So even though it was it was a religious, very religious culture. In other words, there were certain common presuppositions there. There was a certain reinforcement you got from the uh, culture. You, you don't have no. And I'm not just talking, you might not have had archaeological students, but those who were religious were intensely religious. They were devout. And I'm saying that a lot of our church members devotion and intensity is whittling away because of the dominant culture of hedonism and individualism so so you can't even if it was a minute you can't even in talking uh and barry talked about the internal kind of even internal but remember, people are not in silos. You know, preachers and so on. Are influenced by people outside. And the outside cultures, your prosperity, preachers and so on. You know. he's, he's feeding from a cultural tree. So you've got to be an internal thing. But you have to also stop the source of, of the world pollution, which is coming from the society. You know. Okay. I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, so what, the influence. The, the prejudice against theology, religion in general, but theology specifically that is part of content. It is noteworthy that after the First World War, Europe started to drift, and then after the Second World War, the rest of the, the, rest of the world started to drift away from religion. And as you noted, after 9 11, yes. atheism has become, has become uh, more That's right. prevalent. That's right. the, the, so there's a prejudice against. Theology, yes. and I suppose that is part of the problem that is inside the church that any discussion on theology inevitably brings conflict to division. And yes. in an age where people are moving away from conflict, yes. that is that, that the death the de- is stuck against theology. So there's that view. There's a view that you know theology has brought too much hate, too much division, too much emphasis on difference. So let's 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 all uh, get together and let us emphasize all of this head knowledge, you know. So another problem is this experientialism. Let's just concentrate our relationship with the Lord and the Lord Jesus, or person. So people say regularly, "Well, I'm not into religion. I'm into Jesus." Yeah, you know. So that, that kind of a marginalization of of fear. But then, who's Jesus and whose conception of Jesus? They never ask those questions. But I said the power of ideology, you know, is that it passes off itself as just being common sense. It's unquestioned. So we never question these things. And I think our role as a church is really to, to start questioning the things that are unquestionable. I don't want to criticize Ian by telling you that he and I go back very more than three decades and, and, um, and acknowledge that he has come closer to me now than <laughs> you. So I'm very pleased to read his article and to to write to him and, and so on. And to come and share and see that he's, he's growing at last. <laughs> <laughs> Which he got me fired some years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and encourage you, you know, really. I see you've written once. We have to you know, engage it less politically, less of the kind of imaginatory, imaginatory, imaginary, what's the word? Imaginary, <laughs> imaginary ideas. Yes. And far more the real question. The, the society, for example, is in the throes of the tiltivaly inquiry. 
and part of the difficulty that that throws up is what do we do next? We know how bad it can get. But how do we construct a society that doesn't repeat this? Part of the problem is the people for whom the ideas of the come are busy trying to be everybody else. And so I welcome your lecture. I am really very grateful to see some old friends of JTS and others in the audience, which means that you still have a pull. I know that the stream is not quite the broadcast, but it is the point. And thank you for forward to a regular visit and discussion on campus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to call.